And grace and mercy and much peace be to you from God, our Father, who's in heaven, through his Son, his child, our Lord Jesus, in whom we receive the grace of being children and of receiving children. And in other words, of receiving the gift of life, right? That's what a child is. And that's what you and I are meant to be. And it is no coincidence or machination of pastors to somehow arrange in the lectionary that these two readings, which might seem very different, one is about divorce and the other about children, happen to go together. It's not to give me an option in case I feel uncomfortable talking about divorce. <laughs> no, it is because children are the answer to marriage. When God says the two shall become one, he doesn't just say that as a maxim or a rule or even a promise. He embodies that promise and makes it physical in the flesh of a child, doesn't he? The two become one. And what a marvelous world we live in, so full of the gift of life. And we want to take it all apart with our rules so that it can serve us better somehow. But that's not where life comes from. Well, anyway, first of all, I want to talk with the boys and girls. In the Newburgh house, there is a law against spiders. Yeah. And you might say that to the spiders in our house, um, I, Pastor Steve, am the angel of death. It's true. But it might surprise you and the spiders who find their way into our house to know that I'm actually, I really, really like spiders. I think they're cool. And I like all kinds of bugs, and uh, not just because it's fun sport to whack them with a fly swatter, okay? August and Dietrich can tell you that when we see a spider outside, I am their biggest protector. In fact, right now we have about four huge, those yellow garden spiders, they get about two or three inches long. Uh, we have about four of them in the backyard at least. Those are the ones I know of and the ones that I mow around so that they can stay there. And, and now that the egg sacs are, <laughs> are hatched, I'm fighting to be able to keep those because I'd like there to be even more next year. Yeah. A few of you uh, have asked me, some of the kids actually, yeah, you guys have asked me, I think this is a great question. Were there mosquitoes in the Garden of Eden? In other words, if God made such a good world, why are there things in it that bite and itch and even hurt and kill? Or even a bigger question, one that I'll talk with the grown-ups about is, why do we have to have such laws and such rules? in order to make it through in our world? And the answer to all those questions is the one that you could give them. Do you know what the answer is, boys and girls? It's always the same. The answer is Jesus. What do you think Jesus? Now, I don't know if they had mosquitoes in the Middle East, but if they did, what do you think Jesus would have thought of them? Would he have really hated them? complained about them and fussed and whined every time he got a, a mosquito bite? No. Or did Jesus love everything that his father made, even the things that hurt him, even including us, even when our sins nailed him up on a cross to die? Yeah, Jesus loved everyone, didn't he? And that's what made him Jesus. Today, Jesus says, let the little children come to me. Do you ever hear grown-ups say the opposite of that? Sometimes we do, don't we? Yeah, we make rules against being like a child, which is really sad. But he says that. Jesus says that you should not hinder them, little children, because to such as these belongs the kingdom of heaven. He says that, boys and girls, because you still know how to love all the things that you don't control and even things you don't understand. Don't ever let any of the hurts of the world or any of the laws against them, don't let them ever block out 
the love that Jesus has for you and for all of creation. That love, that kind of light, love, is where life is found. Life for spiders, life for you and for me and for everybody. Life even for if you die, Jesus says, yet in thy love you shall live. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Ever since the beginning, when God said, let there be light, the darkness has only existed as a shadow. So what I mean is, if you picture the solar system, right, or the universe, right, light fills the whole universe, and there's only these little specks of shadow where objects like a planet block out the light. Even so, people dig wells to make water more convenient. Those wells are pretty dark and scary if you're to fall down inside of one. But we believe this, too, that a light shines and never stops shining, despite the pain and the blindness that we experience in this world. No shadow can put out that light. On the contrary, that light from God began imparting light, redeeming people and matter that was lost and wandering in the darkness, and restoring the creation of God so that we might shine like stars so that we might be reminders of that light that still fills all of space even when we cannot see it. So as you shine with the light of Jesus, you make life possible. You make sight and beauty and understanding and joy possible even in the shadow of death and sin. And you and I prepare the world for the sunrise, for the end of shadow and the beginning of the eternal day. That's how it is. That's just kind of a little picture, I think, taken from God's creation about the state in which we live. Now, see, here's the thing. In the darkness where we live, it's very easy, it's really easy to bump into things, isn't it, and hurt yourself. <laughs> when you live in the dark, that's just part of the reality. Hence the need for laws. Laws are so very important. But laws cannot give life. The Pharisees in this morning's gospel are interested in what Jesus thinks about divorce. They're like corporate employees who are more interested in the policy for taking sick days than in the opportunity to get the job done, to carry out their vocation, to find fulfillment in what they have to do there. Or they're like a husband who wants to know what's the bare minimum that I can do to keep my wife happy and not complaining so that I can maximize my personal freedom. Instead of finding life in living and dying for his family, for her joy. And too often Christians seek to live by the law. That's, I think, actually what the author of Hebrews was talking about when he said, that we lived subject to the angels, but now have been raised from that life. The angels being those spiritual beings, the gods, the small g gods who ordered everything in the world, right? When we try to seek li to live by the law, when our fussiness or our expertise or our insistence upon our rights, or even our correct understanding of things becomes so great that it blocks out the simple joy of encountering God and his wonders, then we're in trouble. Because it's grace alone, through faith alone. Faith is what you can't see and don't know that saves and gives life. Humans were made for something much bigger than just following the rules or even making the rules. We were made to bear the one true God's image and his love into the world. And that's what we do. 
Nobody can do that like we can. Not even the angels. Someone mentioned at Bible study the other day that they noted this, that the first thing that evil men do is to build up security around themselves. They have to live by that security. You see, everyone agrees that fascism is, is a bad way to govern, except when it comes to governing ourselves. Right? And then, when it comes to ourself, we think everyone should get our own way. The Bible assures us of this before we even experience it, right? It says this at the beginning of John. Men loved darkness rather than light. The Bible says that. It's true. What we love, we love what is impersonal. And we're violently defensive of everything that we claim as our own. And, and this is, by the way, what's driving our world's materialistic philosophy these days and our need to know everything so that we can have it all and live however we want to in the world. It's not what used to drive science, but it's what drives science today. Humanity wants to remake the laws so that it can be a law unto itself. And it's no different from the Pharisees looking for some way of arranging things so that they can have their way out of an unpleasant marriage. This is how the devil works. He has only delusions and distractions to trap you with. That's his only real power. It's a little speck of shadow in which he, he tries to keep you. Meanwhile, Jesus has come to show us the way out of the darkness. And it comes by encounter. Not by knowing, not by enforcing, not by securing. It comes by meeting Jesus and receiving children and receiving one another the way that he does, as children. He says, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of heaven. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms, and he blessed them. Life becomes evident when we're with Jesus. And so, in your prayers, in living a prayerful life, right, you're going to find when you're spending time with Jesus, the power of God is present to lead you out of the very real, but only temporary, only limited, not lasting distractions of pain and failure and depression. He will lead you out of those things into what is lastingly real, eternally true, into light and life. That's what Jesus does. So I want to leave you with a story. It's from a book called The Gift by a Russian author named Nabodov. In it, he describes an elderly person who's dying after a serious illness. And this man lies in a room in the dark with all the shutters closed, and he painfully seeks to resolve the question, is there anything after death or not? And finally, exhausted by these doubts, he decides with a sigh, of course there's nothing. It's as clear as the fact that it's raining outside. Nabodov writes, he sighed, listening to the splashing and gurgling outside his shuttered window. Meanwhile, the writer continues, the spring sun was playing on the roof shingles outside the window. The sky was clear and cloudless, and the upper tenant was watering flowers along the edge of her balcony, and the water was gurgling down. I think in this world, in the midst of our pain, and all the things that get in the way, we are often like Nabodov's man, somehow blind and unaware of the glorious light the miracle of life because of some hurt or jealousy perpetrated by other people seeking more for themselves in all the wrong places or by our own lust for more. 
And perhaps the whole point is that in the midst of people's terrible, hopeless conclusions, there is often no one to go over to the window and throw open the shutters to reveal to them a beautiful spring day. And that is why our Lord became a child for us in a picture of how we may be born again. We are not sad, serious old adults, but we are children. We are the children of God. And it is not our whole duty to throw open the shutters of everyone we see sitting mistaken in the darkness so that all together we may live in the real and present glory of God's light. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Let us continue with the supplication of the faithful and confessing our faith in the Apostles' Creed. On page 11, I invite you to stand. Heavenly Father, strengthen us, your unworthy servants, for your service with the power of your Holy Spirit. Now let us, the faithful, proclaim the death of the Lord, confess his resurrection, and await his coming with joy. Amen.